Living with stage four lung cancer, broadcaster Dame Esther Ranson has renewed her pleas for a debate and a vote on legalised assisted dying. Comes as a report by MPs warns that the government it must tackle the subject, as new laws look increasingly likely in the Isle of Man and in Jersey. Well, we're going to be speaking with Dame Esther's daughter, one of them, Rebecca, in just a moment. But first, a reminder of her announcement in December that she joined an assisting assisted dying clinic in Switzerland amid discussions around the issue on this programme. I have joined Dignitas, but, you know, it, it puts my family and friends in a difficult position because they would want to go with me, and that means that the police might prosecute them. So we've got to do something. At the moment, it's not really working, is it? We should be talking more about how, in a civilised society, we prioritise people when they're coming to the end of their life in ensuring that everybody dies a painful death. Friend. It's not a blanket euthanasia. Yeah. It's for people to have a choice about the end of their life. Thousands face a horrible death every year. And what choice do they have? They can commit suicide, which is perfectly legal. They can put up with it, just suffer, or they can go to Switzerland. 27 countries have tried it. We don't like any of their systems because any system yeah. that, legal, that says to the, the state can decide that we someone was better of off dead. Mm. Well, Esther Ranson's daughter, Rebecca Wilcox, joins us now. It sort of goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, we don't want to be having this conversation no. at all, do we? Uh, neither does, does mm. Esther, neither does your mum. Uh, but just like she has all the way throughout her life, she's won to campaign for others. And, of course, this is now very personal to her. Can I just check in with you on how she's actually doing at the moment? Well, it's the question that none of us ever really have an answer to. If anybody has a relative or is living with stage four cancer, it's an unknowable beast. And as much as we know from the previous scan, the miracle drug that she's on is still working for the moment. So, you know, every day is a blessing and we're mm. just one foot in front of the other and another metaphor for being stoic. Well, that's really yeah. the only way, as you say, you can answer that question. And the, yeah. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a satisfying answer, at least, anyway, on, on, to begin with. Look, um, mm. what seems to be happening is that the government is now being told that the dial is shifting, and this is largely because of your mother. She's done so much in her life to change things uh, for the better in this country. Mm. That the dial is shifting and that there may be piecemeal changes, as we said, in the Isle of Man, Jersey, mm. uh, which is going to make, make it difficult mm. to apply the law as it stands now. So do you feel that actually we are moving forward and, and, and that we might actually be a lot closer to a Commons debate and a free vote? Well, this report which I read alongside the swimming pool as my son practised his um, front crawl, which was a weird situation. <laughs> I had massively high hopes for it. I really thought the dial was moving, as you say. But it feels a bit limp. It feels a bit waffly. I mean, it says all the right things. It's got wonderful amount of evidence that proves that the UK has one of the best palliative care systems in the world and yet still thousands of people are dying in pain, especially with cancer, mm. when sometimes the opioids do not touch it. And anybody that is dying in pain in a hospice, hospital or home is... One person is too many, isn't it? Mm. If that person wanted to have a pain-free, dignified death, why shouldn't they have it? So why are the Isle of Man and Jersey and 250 million other people allowed to choose how they die and not us. We have this waffling 120-page report that basically says, if you go through it and make all the notes, you know, there's no reason not to do this. People are worried about vulnerable older people being forced off their perch or being um, made to feel that they should commit mm -hmm. suicide. There is no evidence that that has happened in other countries. And there's no evidence at all that palliative care would reduce in standard. In fact, there is evidence that it increases in standard. Mm. So the report basically says, why aren't we doing this? Mm. And yet nobody is, there's no debate, there's no law coming in. Um, Mum needs this imminently and thousands of other people will need it quite soon. Of course. And one of the, um, one of the fears rightly or wrongly, which I'm wondering if this report, and certainly from my reading of bits of it that I've been able to see, mm. seems to address, is that sort of... 
unspoken, unfounded fear that somehow if someone is in a state... And I've recently been through a situation where I was working with, with a brilliant team of palliative care in order to manage the end of my husband's life at the last days. And there is this unspoken fear that somehow, as soon as you accept someone is going to pass away and that you're looking at how to make that passing away better, there's a giving up. There's a giving up from doctors. There's a pressure from others to kind of end this quickly. And how do we address that? I wonder if there's almost an emotional reaction to the idea of, oh, we don't want to make this easy because we don't want people to be given up on or we don't want people to be pushed into it, you know. And how do we address that? Because the other countries have, as you say. Yes, so, I mean, that's the other thing. We're not reinventing the wheel here. It is, you know, it's been in Oregon, is it, what, since 97? Everywhere else that has it has worked through their legislation and controls to make sure there are protections in place so that the end is not hurried, the patient has control. We, we could just follow their example. I mean, it's, it's so much easier than people are making it sound because it exists already. It's, it's, it feels a bit like the votes for women and we are, instead of being the wonderful standard bearer, we are lagging behind mm. in, in the dark ages with this. And there's a, in, in your introduction, you talked about my father's death yes. and how we would want mum to have the option for assisted dying so that our memories of her are not replaced by this traumatic, awful demise. Um, but it's, more about her for us. Yes, our memories would be destroyed, and they were destroyed with my father. I can't remember the last time I spoke to him, but I remember in vivid detail every moment that happened in the hospital before he died. But Mum has been this person, as you say, who has changed laws, mm. who has campaigned for other people. This is the first campaign that really is about her, and she wants to have the dignified death that reflects the dignified life. I mean, we're talking about a bad death is something that a patient doesn't choose. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a good death for a patient who has chosen that death. Mm. And that death can be whatever you want it to be. Do you think that Doesn't your... everyone want to die in bed? Do you think Sorry. that your, your clarity of thought about this and your, 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 the depth of your logic as you, as you address this would be as clear if you hadn't been through the experience that you did go through with your father, with Desmond? Well, in the report, they talk about all these roundtable discussions with people that had experienced painful deaths of loved ones and watched it firsthand. And all of them had memories and quotes that struck me to the core because I was like, yes, I remember that. That is a really familiar sentiment. Yeah. This huge, bold, charismatic person that was my father yeah. was reduced to a man in bed surrounded by sh machines, you know, yep. blood, horror, awfulness. Yep. It wasn't as bad as it could have been because it, it was a heart attack. So it wasn't prolonged, but it was still, it was still awful. Right. Well, we'll have to end this here. Um, you, know, you know what I think. I'm so in your corner. And um, I, I really hope that that dial moves to exactly where it should be uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you for your time. Do, do give us uh, our, our, our deepest love. Um, give her a hug from us. Great to talk to you. Uh, well. well, if you watching have been affected by what we're discussing here or are being affected by it as we speak, um, there is a lot of advice and support, if not yet a change in the law, and you can get that uh, support at itv.com forward slash helplines. It's all there. You can avail yourself of it. All right. Very it's... powerful, very powerful advocate for my mum, for oh, her mum in... and all of it. Well, the whole family is mm, quite, a, a quite an extraordinary family. Yeah. And, and it, oh, yes, she's right that, that they're doing it primarily for Esther, for their mother, but it's going to benefit the whole country. If, yeah, if, if just as through. many things that uh, Esther worked on all throughout her life has done as well. Absolutely.